Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Always rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances because this is the will of God in Jesus Christ or in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Alejandro and Christina and Victoria are lighting the Advent candle. Just as a way of reminding ourselves, we are waiting for his arrival. He has come as a baby and he will come again as a glorious king. And we light these candles just as a simple way to remind ourselves of our waiting. So good morning once again. My name's Doug, one of the pastors here. I just love ugly sweaters while at the same time having a baby dedication, right? Bad timing on our part. But hey, there's always something fun, something interesting going on around City Light, and we love it. So this morning's message is actually going to be a little different too. Normally, we just take a passage of Scripture, and we preach through it phrase by phrase. But this morning, I want to tell a story. In fact, most of the sermon is going to be story. But I think if you'll stick with me, you will soon enough discover the joy of Jesus Christ and the truth of the scriptures and the story of this woman's life. But first of all, let let me just start with a question, kind of get us thinking about it. What are your plans this year for Christmas? What are you going to do this year for Christmas? Maybe you're going to go on a trip to see family. Maybe you're going to stay here, attend the City Light Christmas Eve services, something like that. Or even better question, what are you going to eat this year for Christmas? Oh man, I remember growing up, my mom always made cinnamon pull-apart bread for Christmas morning every year. It was so good. I can sort of kind of still taste it even now just because I had it so many times. I'm sure this year for our family, our children will wake to some of their favorite presents under the tree, but don't tell them that. Some of their favorite presents under the tree, the nostalgic sounds of Mannheim steamroller will be playing in the background. And they'll come to a warm, cozy um, living room lit up with bright lights. Then later in the day, we'll go over to grandma and grandpa's house. That's going to be our Christmas. It will be wonderful. It will be comfortable. But 70 years ago, there was a single woman in the woods of North Germany who spent her Christmas quite differently. Her name was Corrie ten Boom. She was 52 years old, and she spent that Christmas in a concentration camp for women. She was a prisoner of Nazi Germany during World War II. At that time, she didn't amount to much more than skin and bones. She had spent many mornings standing at attention for over four hours in below freezing temperatures. Her sister had just died two weeks before that. Her home, her family, her clothes, Her comfort had all been taken from her. But somehow, some way, on Christmas 1944, Corrie ten Boom still had joy. In fact, Corrie spent Christmas Day running bedpans to angry, dying, starving fellow prisoners in the concentration camp hospital. They had been stacked in bunks across a massive sprawling room. Corey had edema, which is extreme swelling in her ankles, and it made it painful just to walk. And yet in her joy, she served by running bedpans to dying prisoners. She served with joy. She survived with joy. And so I ask, how in the world did this woman have joy? And at the same time, I'm wondering, how in the world am I still inventing ways to complain about my life this Christmas, right? I get upset if I have to stand in line for more than five minutes at the post office. Or, God forbid, I'm in a waiting room without my phone. Whatever am I going to do for all that time, right? But Corey, starving cold, in pain, grieving her sister, Corey, was running bedpans to prisoners on Christmas Day. There must have been something supernatural going on in her heart and in her life. And frankly, I want to tap into that. Do you? Do you desire supernatural, larger than your life, 
joy. Do you wonder what it would be like for joy to characterize your life more than complaining? Even when life feels like it's coming undone, even when you're sick or tired or you're alone or you're surrounded or you're stuck in a waiting room without your smartphone, do you desire joy to characterize your life? In the Bible, what the Durans quoted for us, Philippians 4.4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord in the good days. Rejoice in the Lord when you get to sleep in that morning. Rejoice in the Lord when you have enough money to pay the rent. No. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And Paul, who wrote that scripture, has the right to challenge us with that because he wrote it from a prison cell. So just like Corey's life challenges us to supernatural joy, Paul's writing and Paul's example challenges us to supernatural joy. How is that possible? How do we have supernatural joy in our lives? Well, let's look more at the story of Corey ten Boom to see how Jesus gave her supernatural joy. How Jesus empowered her to obey Philippians 4, 4, even through suffering. Just two years before Corey spent that Christmas in concentration camp, she spent Christmas at her childhood home in the Netherlands, where she grew up. She lived with her sister Betsy, some of her aunts, and her dad in a small, skinny home. The first floor was her dad's watchmaking shop, and above the shop were miniature bedrooms, a little dining room, and a kitchen. It was warm, it was cozy, it was filled with memories, and that year it was filled with Corey's family and some Jewish people. Even though Corey's whole family were Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, Dutch-reformed, Calvinistic Christians, that year they were celebrating a Jewish holiday. All over Europe, first in Germany, and then wherever the Nazis had occupied, Jews were being humiliated, hunted, taken, and killed. And so Corey's family, filled with a love for Jesus, regularly received and hid and transported and fed Jewish people to keep them safe. But they knew if they were ever exposed, if they were ever found out, they would suffer the same fate as the Jews. Prison, then death. And yet they still risked their lives to rescue these Jewish people. And the nights in their homes, they would spend singing together, eating together, telling stories and laughing. The joy was pervasive. The joy was invigorating until the doorbell rang. And then when the doorbell rang, questions would rush into Corey and her family's mind. Who is that? What might they be doing? Why are they ringing the doorbell? And their Jewish friends would rush upstairs to a secret hiding place that Corey's dad had built behind a wall. And then someone had to go answer the door. If they opened the door and it was a friend, life returned back to normal. Eating, laughing, singing together. But if they answered the door and it was a police officer or a member of the Gestapo, life literally remained suspended for hours or minutes, however they were there, however long they were there in the house. So Christmas that year included lighting the menorah, but it also included receiving a letter from the local chief of police that said they had to report to his office. Over a couple years, Corey and her family, they had transported and hid and protected dozens of Jewish people, and now they're wondering, have we been found out? Have we been discovered? That was Christmas 1942. So when Corey reported to the chief of police, he was surprisingly sympathetic to their work. But the bad news is that he knew about their work. So even though the chief of police wasn't going to crack down on them, they knew it was merely a matter of time before their whole family was found out. And sure enough, just two months later, While Corey was sick with a high fever and laying in bed, she woke to the doorbell ringing and her six Jewish friends rushing upstairs and getting in the hiding place. Someone went downstairs and opened the door. It was a Nazi officer and his troop of soldiers, and they were not friendly. Corey herself was beat and then arrested and taken captive. Along with Corey, 35 others were arrested in their house that day along with her dad, Casper, 
and her sister Betsy. Thankfully, their Jewish friends were kept safe and were never found out in that hiding place. So what I want to do is just pause here and help us connect into Corey's story a little bit. Most of us, we haven't experienced suffering maybe like this. We haven't been unjustly in prison. But all of us have probably received bad news at some point in time. We've gone from surviving to failure to thrive. We've gone from at least a glimmer of hope to our world going dark. We've all had those times and those moments. When has that happened in your life? Was it the loss of a loved one? Was it the ripping apart of a relationship? Was it the taunts of someone who you thought was your friend? Was it the disapproval of a parent or the disapproval of a child? We've all received bad news. We've all had days when we want to open our Bibles, take out our scissors, and cut Philippians 4.4 out of there. Not today, Jesus. Not for a while, please. And that's the, the moment Corey encountered. What happened next in Corey's life? Next, she was taken to a federal prison in the Netherlands. And within a short time, she was put in a solitary cell. It was about two paces wide, six paces long, just large enough for a, straw, a, a bed of straw and one human being. Then, due to the life-risking generosity of a nurse and the providence of of God giving her a prolonged sickness, Corey managed to obtain and smuggle in four packets of literature, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. She had no friends. She had no contact with the outside world. She had no comfort, but she did have the living word of God. She wrote about it this way. Listen to this quote. She writes, As my health returned, I was able to use my eyes longer. Now, like a starving man, I gulped entire gospels at a reading, seeing whole the magnificent drama of salvation. And as I did, an incredible thought prickled the back of my neck. Was it possible that this, all of this that seemed so wasteful and so needless, this war, this prison, this very cell, none of it was unforeseen or accidental? Could it be part of the pattern first revealed in the gospels? Hadn't Jesus been defeated as utterly and unarguably as our little group and our small plans had been? Catch this. But if the Gospels were truly the pattern of God's activity, then defeat was only the beginning. I would look around at the bare little cell and wonder what conceivable victory could come from a place like this. Did you guys catch that? She gulped down gospels and in so doing discovered that the pattern and the process of joy is this. Death, then resurrection. Defeat, then victory. It's backwards to how we think. It's backwards to our world and our culture. We think sustained success. We think comfort and ease leads to joy. But as she gulped down gospels, Corey discovered that death leads to resurrection. Defeat leads to victory. This is the path and the process of joy. And so it is with Jesus himself. Just as Corey looked around her cell and wondered what conceivable victory could come from a place like this, someone might look at Jesus' birth in a manger and say, what king of glory could ever arise from this trough full of cow feed? What conceivable victory could ever come from a place like this? But for Jesus, his birth in a manger was only his first step into death. The cross was coming, and Jesus knew it. Similarly for Corey, her time in that solitary cell in prison was only her first step into death. Because shortly thereafter, she heard about the death of her father. And you have to understand a little bit of the relationship between Corey and her father to get why this was so devastating. And men, I want you to lean in a little bit. If you hear nothing else this morning, men, hear this about Corey's father, Casper Ten Boom. The first thing you need to know about Casper Ten Boom is you can't compete with his beard. Like, I'm sorry, you know, some of you have awesome beards, but like he should have been in Duck Dynasty. He was just a few decades too early. You know, like incredible beard. The second thing you should know about, or the other things you should know about Casper Ten Boom. 
okay? He was a watchmaker. You can't find a job more boring than watchmaker, right? He was uneducated. He didn't even have a high school graduation. His wife, Corey's mom, spent most of her adult years sick and confined to her bed. And yet, Casper Ten Boom raised five children who loved Jesus Christ, sniffed out the evil of the Nazi regime early on, and then poured out their lives so that the poor, hurting, and broken could know Jesus Christ. That's incredible. How did Casper Ten Boom do that? As I read, I noticed three patterns to his parenting. Let me just share these with you, dads. Number one, he read the Bible with his kids. Every morning in the Tin Boom home, the exact same thing happened. It was really predictable. Everybody would come down, gather around the breakfast table, and dad would read one chapter from the Bible. No theological dissertations, no waxing eloquently about how God is three in one, just dad reading one chapter from the Bible every day. And so his children held fast to the word of God even through the darkest of times. Number two, Casper Ten Boom welcomed people into his house. Corey writes about how most every night growing up, there was someone in their home. And most every night, they were singing songs out loud with whomever those guests were. It was a house of hospitality and joy. And so the routine of morning readings would give way to the routine of evening celebrations. Therefore, Casper's children had a song of joy in their hearts that they had memorized, sung many times, had a song of joy in their hearts even through the darkest of times. And number three, Casper Ten Boom entered into his children's lives. He didn't maintain a safe distance. Instead, he knew them, cared for them, understood them, was involved with them. There's a story when Corey was in late high school. She fell in love with one of her big brother's friends. And it seemed that he fell in love with her too. He would seek her out. He would talk with her. He would want time with her. And then one week, they got to spend a lot of time together because their families were in the same city at the same time. So that whole week, they're just talking, connecting, and they're talking about their future life together. How many children did they want to have? What would their house be like? Where would they live? What would they enjoy doing together? It seemed they were falling in love. And so then they had to separate and go back to their cities, but surely they would write letters to one another and keep in touch. Just a few months later, this young man arrived at the Tin Boom home. They opened the door to see him standing there, a different young woman by his side, her hand in his, and a diamond ring on her finger. And he said, Corey, I would like you to meet my fiance. Oh, that's just horrible. Heart wrenching. And so Corey, Corey is broken. Her family kind of, you know, runs uh, like they, uh, what is that, run cover? They, they kind of take care of the mess so that she can just deal with her pain. And then after they leave, Corey bolts it upstairs for her bedroom. She's crying, she's weeping. And Casper, what did he do? Dads, what would you do in that situation? Casper Ten Boom went to her room, sat down with her on the bed, and spoke tender words with her. He said, Corey, do you know what hurts the most? Love hurts the most. And then they went on, and together they got to talk about the love of Jesus and the hurt that Jesus incurred because of his love for his people. Dads, that's fatherhood right there. Okay, Casper Ten Boom didn't do a lot of things. Casper Ten Boom didn't make a lot of money, but Casper Ten Boom did a few things really well. He read the Bible with his kids. He welcomed people into his home with singing and joy, and he entered into his kids' lives. He knew them. Oh, dads, might we do the same thing today in our generation for the sake of the next generation? City Light, could you imagine if the dads in our church were like this if they just regularly read the bible with their kids now listen if they ask you a difficult theological question just ask chris hereska he has all the answers right (laughs) imagine dads if all you did was just read one chapter a day if you just connected your children to christian community welcomed people into your home and had some fun and then you walked with your kids you knew your kids you enjoyed your kids and you were in their lives the fruit of that 25 30 years from now would be staggering It would be incredible. 
And so now you can understand a little bit why the news of her dad's death was a blow to Corrie ten Boom like none other. Days and weeks in a solitary cell could never hurt as much as hearing about her dad's death. And yet more suffering was to come. Shortly after she got this horrible news, she and her sister Betsy were transported to a concentration camp in Ravensbrück, Germany. The solitary cell in prison was like a five-star hotel compared to Ravensbrück. The straw, the bed of straw that she slept on in prison was like a memory foam mattress compared to the sleeping arrangements in Ravensbrück. If prison was a manger, Ravensbrook was like a cross. There were 35,000 women in the camp at Ravensbrook. Corey and her sister Betsy were put in barracks number 28. It was a long, sprawling room, literally packed with bunks. There wasn't any walking room among the beds. They were just crammed together. Women were made to sleep at least four or five to a bed, no personal space, barely a blanket. And the whole time that this is going on, you're wondering if your prison number is going to be called for death. Ravensbrook was an extended torture of the worst sorts for women. Every single morning, the ladies had to stand at attention in perfectly organized rows. If you were out of line, if you were late, if you were weak, you were beaten. And the temperatures didn't matter. Even if it was below freezing, they would stand in, at attention for hours upon hours. Then after that, they were all made to work unjustly and unfairly for more than 11 hours each day. So what did Corey and Betsy do in this place of pain and torture, sickness and death? Listen to how Corey answers this question. She writes, as the rest of the world grew stranger, one thing became increasingly clear, and that was the reason that the two of us, her and her sister, were here. Why others should suffer, we were not shown. As for us, from morning until lights out, whenever we were not in ranks for roll call or working, our Bible, they, they had, again, miraculously smuggled in a Bible. An incredible story. But here's what she's saying. Our Bible was the center of an ever-widening circle of help and hope. The blacker the night around us grew, the brighter and truer and more beautiful burned the word of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. She just quoted Romans 8. And so together, Betsy and Corey sustained one another's joy. Sometimes it was Corey reminding her sister Betsy that Jesus had faced every single brutality that they were now facing. Other times it was Betsy encouraging Corey reminding her and helping sustain her joy. One such time happened when Corey kept complaining about the horrible conditions of barracks number 28. So Betsy simply asked, uh, Corey, what is the reading in the Bible today? The reading was 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What? Impossible, Corey said. What could we possibly have to be thankful for? Betsy countered quickly. Each other will together. This Bible, these ladies. And Corey's like, oh, yeah, okay, yes, 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 I'm thankful for all those. But Betsy kept right on going. She said, this bed to sleep in, the overcrowded room, the fleas. And Corey's like, the fleas? You mean the little black bugs we have to sleep with? I'm not thankful for the fleas. I can't be thankful for the fleas. As it turns out, due to the overcrowding and the nasty fleas, the guards of Raven, Ravensbrook refused to ever inspect barracks number 28. And so Corey and Betsy and eventually dozens of others could have nighttime Bible studies they could sing songs to Jesus. They could pray for one another. And they led many women to Jesus Christ, all without one single guard ever bothering them. And so Corey realized, thank God for the fleas. Thank God for the fleas. 
Day after day, the work continued, and night after night, they gathered to praise Jesus until early December 1944. Betsy's condition had deteriorated so quickly in Raven's book that she had to go to the camp hospital, or what they called a hospital. And just two days after that, Betsy died. It was December 16, 1944. Corey's companion was gone. Federal prison in the Netherlands was like a birth in a manger. It was lonely and dehumanizing. Months and months at Ravensbrook was like a cross. It was humiliating and torturous. But the death of her sister was, it was like death to Corey. Her last glimmer of light was gone. Her last spark of life had gone dark. And yet, two weeks later, it was her in that camp hospital. And she was running bedpans to dying, starving prisoners and it was Christmas Day, 1944. And so Corey once again asked a similar question. How could victory ever come from such defeat? Have you ever asked that of your own life? How can the victory of joy be sustained even through suffering? Whether your suffering is large and significant or your suffering is small, how can the victory of joy be sustained? I, I want to pull just three really quick things from Corey Ten Boom's story. There's many others. I just want to highlight three, and they go back to her dad, Casper. Number one, how to sustain joy. Read your Bible. Through her suffering, Corey cherished the Bible. She would risk her life and her safety to get access to a Bible, and then she would risk her life and safety even more to read that and share that publicly. Our joy is sustained by the precious living word of God in the Bible. Number two, what can we take away? Have a Betsy. Have a Betsy. Corey would not have made it without the encouragement of her sister, and so it is with us. When we face suffering or setback, we desperately need some friends who can just ask us, what was your reading in the Bible today? We need friends who can help us fight for joy in real life. And number three, remember that the path of joy is death, then resurrection. This is against, again, everything we've ever been taught. But you got to know, God never once promised to deliver us from suffering in this life. But he did promise to be with us in that suffering. Corey got this. She understood this. So she didn't run from suffering. In fact, she embraced suffering. Now listen, it would have been perfectly acceptable in that concentration camp hospital when Corey had edema for her to stay in her bed and elevate her legs so that the swelling would go down. But she didn't. She got out and ran bedpans to dying, starving prisoners in joy. She expected to find joy in suffering. That's incredible. And as the providence of God would have it, Corey was released from camp just six days after that Christmas. She spent Christmas Day in prison. She spent New Year's Day a free woman. Death, then resurrection. Defeat, then victory. And oddly enough, it reminds us of who? Our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, on Friday on the cross, Jesus was a dead man. He was seemingly defeated in every way imaginable. But then on Sunday with the empty tomb, Jesus was alive. He was truly victorious in every way imaginable. There's this passage in Hebrews 12, verse 2, where it says that it was for joy that Jesus endured the cross. It was for joy that he endured. It was for joy that Jesus took on sin and shame and suffering. It was for joy that he never gave up, never gave in, never turned back on his road to Calvary. It was for joy that he was born in a manger, raised a poor carpenter's son, suffered unjustly, died unfairly. It was for joy. What was that joy? I think among other things, Jesus' joy was knowing that someone like Corey Ten Boom would have all of her joy wrapped up in him through the worst of suffering, through the pain and the heartbreak of relationship, through federal prison solitary cell, 
And even through a flea-infested barracks number 28, Corey's joy survived. Corey's joy sustained because Corey Tim Boom's joy was not in her circumstances. Her joy was not in comfort or ease. Her joy was not in wealth or riches or certain presents under the tree. Her joy wasn't even finally in family or friends. Her joy had roots that went way down deep into Jesus Christ and his word. So she discovered the truth that there is no pit too deep that God is not deeper still. When she lost someone she thought she loved, Jesus was there with her, and her joy was in Jesus. In a solitary cell in federal prison, Jesus was there with her, and her joy was in Jesus. Standing in the cold for hours at roll call, Jesus was there with her, and her joy was in Jesus. Trying to sleep in a flea-infested bed, Jesus was there with her, and her joy was in Jesus. When the ladies gathered around to read the Bible and sing songs, Jesus was there with her, and her joy was in Jesus. When she walked out of that camp on New Year's Day, Jesus was there with her, and her joy was in Jesus. The testimony of Corey Ten Boom's life is simple. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. May it be so in our own lives in ever-increasing ways this Christmas. Let's pray together. Father God, we bless your name and we praise your name. We glorify you. We're thankful just for the story of Corey Ten Boom, for her joy and suffering, her enduring through dehumanization, her enduring through isolation, her enduring through pain, joy, the loss of a dad, the loss of her closest sister. Thank you that her joy survived and her joy was sustained. But at the end, God, we know that her life merely points us to Jesus Christ. And oh God, thank you that he sustained his joy. Thank you that his joy survived through the sin, the shame, and the suffering of the cross. He held fast to the precious word of God. He held fast to giving you glory even when it meant the loss of his most loved one, you. So Father, we thank you for Corey and we praise you and glorify you for your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, my sense is that there's some of us this morning who we feel like in that path and process of joy, we're stuck at death or we're stuck at defeat. and We haven't moved on to resurrection or victory. And so Father, would you make your presence known to those this morning? Would you open their eyes and open their hearts to see Jesus in their midst with them in that place? Help them to see that Jesus isn't waiting at the victory stage, waiting for them to get out of defeat. Jesus is with them in defeat. Jesus is with them in victory. Oh God, open eyes to see where Jesus is in our lives. Holy Spirit, come and speak to your children personally, specifically, and powerfully. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.